The Japanese role-playing genre has given us tons of great, quality games over the years. Some better than others, obviously. With that said, while most of the standout titles we were fortunate enough to have released in the West, there's still a good amount out there that managed to slip through the cracks and never leave their origin country. This is due to a variety of reasons. Before the success of Final Fantasy VII, there was a period of time where JRPGs were just considered too risky to try to localize. Honestly, I don't blame them. I mean, why take the effort of translating thousands of lines of dialogue in very story-heavy games when you can just translate like 100 lines of dialogue in a platformer and still end up selling more than twice the copies? For developers, the answer seemed obvious. After the success of Final Fantasy VII though, Developers started to realize there was a market for the genre outside their country and decided to take more risks in bringing them over here. Luckily, during the PS1 and PS2 era, most of the great JRPGs did receive English localizations, except for some of the more niche titles, some of which we'll cover in this video. Speaking of, this video is going to focus on mainly older games, as in more recent times, nearly every notable JRPG seems to get an English release these days, which is pretty damn cool. Honestly, there's so many titles that could qualify for this video, so to be completely real, I'm only going to focus on the games we have physical copies of, so we can show some cool, real life footage. If there's some popular JRPGs that you know that never left Japan that we didn't include here, it's probably only because of that reason. If this video does well enough though, we do plan on a part two and maybe part three. So, just something to keep in mind. Last thing, most of the titles included here will have English fan translations by now. However, there are a couple that still don't. Sorry. Now, this has been more than a long enough intro, so let's stop wasting your time and just cut to it. Here's a list of eight great JRPGs that never left Japan. To start this list off, we have Tengai Makyo Zero, otherwise known as Far East of Eden Zero. Developed by the Red Company, Far East of Eden Zero is the fourth game in a long-running franchise that's unfortunately never left Japan. It's a real shame because the entire series looks charming as hell with wacky Japanese humor and vibrant colors. However, ironically, that wacky humor and abundance of cultural references may have been part of the reasons why these were never released in the West. For this video, I'm only going to focus on the entry for the Super Famicom, but all the other games are easily worth checking out as well, maybe in a future video. Far East of Eden Zero is a traditional, turn-based JRPG through and through. From the town and dungeon exploration, to the Dragon Quest style combats with gorgeous battle sprites, and just about anything else you can imagine from the genre, really. What immediately might stick out to you though, is just how amazing this game looks for a Super Famicom game. In addition to being released later in the console's lifespan, it also featured a rare expansion ship that only two other games on the Super Famicom ever had. Not only did this allow for prettier and more detailed graphics than its contemporaries, but it also added an internal game clock, which surprisingly affects the game in a lot of ways. Like, there's some shops and festivals that you can only visit on certain days for example. For the time of its release, it was pretty groundbreaking and revolutionary stuff. I'm not sure if it was the very first game to do something like this, but it had to be one of the first. It's also probably another reason why it never got released in the West, as this would have made it quite a bit more expensive. That, plus the loads and loads of text in this game. Seriously, this game's script is absolutely massive. I don't really blame them for not wanting to translate it and bring it over. When it comes to the story and characters, there's a lot of charm, for sure, but at the same time, it's also quite cliche and nothing super original. The game's strengths definitely lie in the immersive environments, the detailed graphics and character sprites, the amazing music, and just the overall charm and sense of wonder to the game. There's just so much to love here. It reminds me of a simpler time of how imaginative JRPGs could be despite the technical limitations of their hardware. 
As of 2017, an English fan translation does exist, so if this feudal Japan RPG looks appealing to you, there's no better time to finally check it out. Coming up next, we have Star Ocean Blue Sphere. Star Ocean Blue Sphere was developed by Tri-Ace and came out for the Game Boy Color. It's actually a spin-off and direct sequel to the PlayStation RPG, Star Ocean The Second Story, and features all of the playable characters from that game. This came out really late in the Game Boy Color's lifespan, even after the Game Boy Advance was already released. Knowing that, it's not too hard to see why they decided not to bring this over. Because of how late the game was released in the console's lifespan though, it's an absolute technical marvel. The graphics, and especially the cutscenes, look stunningly beautiful for a Game Boy Color game. There's also a huge amount of content in this game, from all of the characters and their playstyles, to the skill and stat mechanics, and so much more. It's like they try to fit a whole console RPG experience in a tiny handheld cartridge. Very, very impressive. Story-wise, this game is pretty basic to be honest, as I would say it's more focused on the gameplay. For fans of the original game, it is super cool to see all the characters back in action though. This time, they all have unique field abilities, which you will have to make a lot of use of, encouraging you to switch them around a bit. This ranges from stuff like burning down obstacles, collecting stats on enemies, and much, much more. Battle-wise, the game plays out like a 2D action RPG, pretty similar to older Tales of games actually, like Tales of Fantasia or Tales of Destiny. It's nothing that crazy I'd say, but it's still pretty fun. Music-wise, series composer Motoi Sakuraba makes a return here and pushes the Game Boy Color to its absolute limits. It's very impressive what he managed to pull off here, and shows that no matter the system, this dude knows how to write music. If you're a fan of the Star Ocean series, or are just curious to see what type of JRPG experience they were able to pack on a Game Boy Color cartridge, then Blue Sphere is definitely one worth checking out. An English fan translation, luckily, does exist, so have at it. The next game we have on our list is Bahamut Lagoon. Bahamut Lagoon was developed by the one and only Squaresoft and was released for the Super Famicom. Yep, this is indeed a prime 9D Squaresoft RPG, so you know you're in for a good time with that already. After primarily specializing in turn-based RPGs, this was one of their first forays into the strategy RPG genre. And man, is it a pretty damn good one. It's a late era Super Famicom game, so the graphics look fantastic with a really cool and unique visual aesthetic involving floating islands. Movement on the battlefield plays pretty similarly to other titles in the genre with the grid based combat, however the battles themselves are quite different. When you attack an enemy, it transitions into a turn based battle where you have full control over a squadron of characters. It then just plays out like your average Final Fantasy game at that point. It's kind of like a fusion of both strategy RPGs and turn-based RPGs, and it's a lot of fun. What makes Bahamut Lagoon even more different though, is that there are various dragons you can raise, influencing their growth, and have them fight on your team. The whole dragon raising system is honestly quite complex, with a lot of stuff factoring in into how the dragon is going to evolve. It's definitely something different and very ambitious, so I appreciated it for that. While this may have just been the translation that I played, I didn't find the story incredibly interesting as I found myself more playing it for the gameplay and beautiful art direction. I did see that there was a new English translation released after the one I played though, so this could improve a lot of things with the story, I'm not sure. Regardless, the original blend of turn-based and strategy RPG battles, along with the incredible music and top-notch graphical presentation, make Bahamut Lagoon easily worth playing. Check it out if you haven't already. Coming up next, we have Tales of Rebirth. Tales of Rebirth was developed by the Namco Tales Studio and was released for the PS2 and later the PSP. It's the sixth mainline entry in the Tales series, and the second one that we didn't get on the PS2. Out of all the Tales of games that haven't been released outside Japan, 
This is honestly the one I've been most interested in. The unique blend of super detailed character sprites traversing through semi-3D environments just looks really, really cool. I legit can't even think of another game that has this type of graphical style and presentation. Battles are also quite unique for the series, having the 2D character sprites fighting in semi-3D environments where they can move between three different planes to engage with enemies. Story-wise, Tales of Rebirth seems to focus a lot on the racial conflict between humans and beast people coexisting together, and overall just seems to have some pretty heavy and mature plot elements. From what I've gathered online at least, as you can see by the footage, unfortunately, an English fan translation does not exist yet. So yeah, I haven't actually played this game myself, but with that said, I'm pretty damn sure I would like it just based on how it looks and considering how much I like the other games in the series. So unless you guys know how to read Japanese, you're all shit out of luck just like I am. But who knows, maybe one of these days we'll finally get a translation. It certainly would be a day of rejoice for all Tales of fans everywhere. One can only dream, right? The next game we have on our list is Shin Megami Tensei 2. Shin Megami Tensei 2 was developed by Atlas and was released for the Super Famicom. There are a couple other Shin Megami Tensei games on the Super Famicom, such as the first Shin Megami Tensei game and Shin Megami Tensei If. The first game actually got an official English iOS port a while back, which I had no idea about and so researching for this video, while the second game, along with Shin Megami Tensei If, have still yet to receive official English translations. Come on Atlas, what are you guys doing? With that said, I'm only going to focus on the second one for this video. As opposed to the more modern setting of the first game, SMT2 takes place in a post-apocalyptic setting where you assume the control of a gladiator with amnesia by the name of Hawk. Yeah, this was before the whole amnesia trope kind of became so widespread, so cut it a little slack. Other than that, SMT2 plays out pretty similarly to the first title, with the first person dungeon crawling and all of the demon recruiting mechanics. Though similar, it's pretty much an improvement in most ways however. The gameplay is just overall a smoother experience and not quite as grindy. And while the story is much different from the first game, it also takes more of a center stage here. The open-ended nature of the game, with all the multiple possible endings, is still present though. The soundtrack is also just as amazing as ever, with a really cool ambiance that is nearly unrivaled, especially in the 16-bit department. It's so unique. If you're curious to see some of the origins of the Shin Megami Tensei franchise, and don't mind some old-school game design, like grinding and frequent random battles, then Shin Megami Tensei 2 is definitely worth checking out. A fan translation, luckily, does exist, and it's quite good. Coming up next, we have both The Legend of Heroes Zero no Kaseki and Eo no Kaseki, otherwise known as Trails from Zero and Trails to Azure. These games were both developed by Nihon Falcom and were originally released for the PSP. I'm including both here because much like the first two Trails in the Sky games, they're direct sequels to one another and basically just one giant story. And while you don't technically have to play the Trails in the Sky games in order to play these, they do feature characters from those games, creating an even bigger, overarching plot. Both of these arcs, if you will, also serve as prerequisites for the Trails of Cold Steel series on later consoles. Yeah, when it comes to deep lore, the Legend of Heroes series is basically like the Star Wars or MCU of JRPGs. Anyway, these two titles are known as the Crossbell Arc and have you playing as members of a police force. Yeah, that doesn't really sound that cool, I guess, but trust me, it's a lot more compelling than what it sounds like. The extremely detailed world building and all the rich character development are back just as good as ever. Unfortunately, up until this point though, they were also the only titles from the mainline series never released in the West. Luckily, Falcom actually seems to have heard our prayers and plans to bring these over stateside in 2022 and 2023. Due to how popular the Trails of series has been recently, it's not hard to see why they finally came to this decision. Thank God. So yeah, with that said, these games won't really be relevant for this list in a year or two's time, so just consider this my way in spreading some more awareness to the older games in the series. They're all absolute classics and well worth playing. 
The next game we have on our list is Magic School Lunar. Magic School Lunar was developed by both Studio Alex and Game Arts and was released for the Sega Saturn. It's actually an enhanced remake of Lunar Walking School, which came out for the Game Gear. Well, I mean, they call it a remake, but it's really just an entirely different game. Not only are the graphics, obviously, much improved, but there's more playable characters, a more complex story, anime cutscenes, battles are presented differently, and much, much more. Plot-wise, the game takes place hundreds of years before the first game in the series, Lunar the Silver Star. With that said, it's definitely not as epic or story-heavy as that one though, as it's more of a light-hearted romp. I'd say the character interactions, the overall charm, and the feel-good vibes of the game are definitely the main selling points here. Unfortunately, as you can see, an English translation does not yet exist, leaving this one still a pretty big mystery in a lot of fans' eyes. And unlike Tales of Rebirth, this one probably doesn't stand a chance of ever getting any type of official English release. Our only chance is probably just holding out hope for some of the fans to take it upon themselves. I believe efforts have been made in the past, but sadly, nothing has ever come to fruition. However, if Star Ocean Blue Sphere can get a fan translation nearly 20 years after its release, there might still be hope for this one yet. Only time will tell. Alright, to finish off this list, we have the Farland Story Series. Farland Story was developed by Technical Group Laboratory and has been released for various consoles such as the Super Famicom, PC-98, PCFX, and more. I'm willing to bet there's a good amount of you who have probably heard of every game slash series on this list so far, besides from this one. Farland Story is a very unknown, yet surprisingly big strategy RPG series that never left Japan. It's kinda hard to find exact information, but I believe there's around 8 mainline entries or so, along with various spin-offs and remakes as well. Gameplay-wise, it had a lot in similar with other strategy RPGs at the time, such as Fire Emblem and Langrisser. Though with that said, it featured much less complex systems and also a much lighter story. Honestly, Farland's story is kind of like a lighter, more newbie-friendly version of those games, for better or for worse. As the series went on, however, the games did seem to get much bigger and better. But now, the real question. Are these games worth visiting in 2021? Well, compared to older Fire Emblem and Shining Force games, not really to be honest, but if you've already played those and are itching for some more strategy RPGs from around that time period, or if you're just someone who's curious about old, obscure Japanese games, then these may be worth checking out. If nothing else, all of the character art and sprites are charming as hell and sure to put a smile on your face. I believe the first three do have English translations, the rest though, I'm not too sure about. You may have to do a little digging yourself if you're curious enough. Alright, and that about wraps up this video. Thanks for watching everyone, we hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider either hitting that like button, or even subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. Have any of you guys played any of the translated versions of any of the games here? If so, what'd you guys think? Let us know in the comments below. Honestly, I could have made an entire video with Squaresoft gems from the 90s alone, but I figured I would save some of those for part 2, and maybe part 3. As always, huge thank you to our Patreon supporters. Your generosity is very much appreciated. Other than that, hope you have an awesome day everyone. This is Gaming Productions. Until next time.